Welcome back to our series titled Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. In this series, we're looking at the prophetic book of Revelation, unfolding the prophecies of Revelation, but specifically and distinctly Revelation chapter 14. In Revelation chapter 14, God unfolds his last day message. He describes that message symbolically as being carried by three angels in mid-heaven. And it's that message that we are unpacking, that message that we're studying. Now, if you've been with us in previous presentations, you've noted that in our first presentation, we looked at the great controversy between good and evil. We studied the fact that down through the ages, when Christ has been in conflict with Satan, Jesus has never lost a battle. Jesus wins, Satan loses. And that's the great theme of the book of Revelation, that Christ is predominant, that he will be victorious over Satan in the last days of verse history. Because when you look at Revelation, it talks about a mark called the mark of the beast. It talks about a time when no man can buy or sell. It talks about persecution and a death decree. And if you allow those images to grip your mind and strangle you, you'll lose your hope. So the theme of the book of Revelation really is much more than the persecution that's coming. It's the triumph of Jesus Christ in the last days of verse history. In our last presentation, we looked at the idea of harvest in the book of Revelation, that there'll be two harvests, a harvest of golden grain and a harvest of gory grapes. Righteousness will be fully manifest, unrighteousness will be fully manifest. And we look there at the book of Revelation very, very carefully. And we noted that in those two harvests, there will be two eternal choices, that every human being on a planet called Earth will make an eternal choice. In this presentation, we are going to probe more deeply into Revelation 14, verse 6, the first of those three cosmic or three angels' messages. So as we launch right into our topic, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts for the great messages that you've given in the book of Revelation. We sense that these messages come from Christ. And so as we study them more deeply, help us to be able to understand them more fully. And as we understand them more fully, may our lives more fully reflect you. Change us by your grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. My topic in this presentation is hopes, grace-filled, end time message. Have you ever noticed how corporations have slogans? For example, MasterCard's slogan is, there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Have you noticed Nike's slogan, just do it? The Nike symbol, Nike of course meaning victory. Then there is the slogan of Apple computers, think different. Somebody certainly had to be thinking differently when they developed the Apple computer. And then you go beyond that to the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print. When you read that slogan, you, if you know anything about news media in America, you immediately think of the New York Times. L'Oreal, the famous cosmetic group in Paris, because you're worth it. Throughout these various corporations, there are slogans. These slogans are catch phrases. Entrepreneur Magazine puts it this way. The slogan for these businesses is a catch phrase or a small group of words that are combined in a special way to identify a product or company. So you may not even see the product or know the company, but when you hear the slogan or the catchphrase, immediately you identify. When you see the little swoosh of Nike, immediately you identify with that product brand. When you read MasterCard and you see their slogan, those simple circles with red and yellow or orange, you immediately identify with that slogan. For some things money can't buy, but for everything else there's MasterCard. You know, you, you identify with those slogans. Israel had a statement of faith that identified Israel. It set it apart from all of the heathen nations. Their statement of faith was found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. 
written in Hebrew, but translated into English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Children from the earliest ages in the Jewish nation were taught by their mothers that expression. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Mothers rocking their Jewish babies at three months old, six months old, as mama was rocking the baby, mama sang to her this, what they called the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, there was an interesting experience that occurred during the Second World War. Mothers continued during the war to teach their children Deuteronomy 6.4. They did not want these Jewish children to lose their sense of identity. And before the children were even learned, even learned to speak, they were taught this phrase. During the war, many Jewish parents, knowing that the Holocaust was present, knowing they would be transported to prison camps and die, put their children in orphanages. Some of these orphanages were run by Catholic priests and nuns. The idea of the Jewish parents was this could save our children, and after the war, they will be reunited either with us if we get out of the prison camp alive or if we don't with relatives or other Jewish families. When the war ended and thousands of Jews came back from these terrible, horrific prison camps, many of course died, over six million died in these prison camps, one of the greatest crimes against humanity in the history of the world. When many of them came back, they looked for their children, couldn't find them. On one occasion, two rabbis came to a Catholic orphanage and they said to the priest who was at the orphanage, we would like to look for Jewish children here. He said, there are no Jewish children here at all. Uh, you're mistaken, there are no Jewish children here. The rabbis left, the priest wouldn't let them come into the orphanage to inquire and discover whether there were Jewish children. They came back in the evening and they said, could you just at least let us walk through the orphanage one time? Can you just let us walk through the nursery, the sleeping room? When the priest allowed them to do that, the rabbi began to sing the Shema. He began to sing, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he began to sing it in Hebrew. Children woke up from their cribs. They began to say, Mama, Mama, Mama. They recognized that Hebrew. They recognized that Shema. It identified them as a people. And the rabbi said to the priest, that's one of mine. That's one of mine. There was nothing the priest could do. He had to give those Jewish children back to their rightful place in the Jewish community. The Shema identified them. Is there a Shema? Is there a point of identity for God's people today? There is. The book of Revelation, the three angels' messages are our Shema. They are our rallying point. They identify a community of believers that God has raised up in the divine drama of destiny to prepare a world for the second coming of Christ. In the book of Evangelism, page 119, I read this statement. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. Now, you may be a Seventh-day Adventist watching this broadcast, watching this DVD, and uh, if you are, I want to undergird this reality that the message of the three angels is not simply something that is tacked on to Adventist faith, but it's the very foundation. If you are not a Seventh-day Adventist, I invite you to journey with us. I invite you to walk with me as we go through these messages. And there's only one body in the world that's preaching the three angels' messages, and that's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God raised up the Adventist Church miraculously. 
Seventh-day Adventists believe that there's Christians in every denomination. Adventists believe that there's loving, God-fearing people in every religious communion. But we also believe that in the divine drama of destiny, in the providence of God, humbly we believe that God has raised up a movement to prepare a world for his soon coming and that the identification of that movement comes in this Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12. These are some of the most significant verses in all the Bible, and they clearly identify God's last day people today. So let's walk through these verses together. Let's study them together and discover what they say. In this book of Angels, on page 119, that statement goes on. They, Adventists, have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages, these three cosmic messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are not to allow anything else to absorb their attention. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. In the blazing light of eternity, in this cosmic battle between good and evil, Jesus has sent a last day message to the world. Jesus has sent a message in this message of the three angels. Revelation is a grace-filled book. The book of Revelation is filled with the grace and love of Jesus Christ. It's filled with the grace of God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whose revelation is this? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where did he get it? which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. You know, when you read Revelation 1, verse 1, here is a divine chain of truth. It says this. It says, Revelation. It is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Where did he get it? God gave it to him. What did Jesus do when God gave it to him? He sent and signified it, according to Revelation 1, verse 1, by his angel, to whom? To his servant John. So God has a message for all mankind just at end time. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel. The angel flies from heaven, impresses John, who's in exile in his 90s on the island of Patmos, and John writes it down, and you and I take that in our hands today. This precious message from the book of Revelation is not a human message. It doesn't come to us merely through human opinion. It comes to us directly from the heart of God, directly from the throne room of the universe. If there is a message that comes from the throne room of the universe, that message must be critically important. That's why we're spending time looking at this message from Revelation, particularly Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12. Now notice, when Re Revelation 1 sets forth the entire tone of the book, it sets forth who this Jesus actually is. And it says he is the one that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So Revelation chapter 1 sets forth this magnificent Christ. It sets forth this grace-filled, hope-filled book in the context of God's love, in the context of a God that cares for us so deeply that he doesn't want one of us to be lost. Revelation, indeed, is a grace-filled book. There are some people that have said to me, as I've studied the Bible with them, I'm hesitant to study the book of Revelation because of the fact that uh, I only want to study the Gospels about Jesus. They have forgotten that according to Revelation 1, verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Other people have said Revelation is a closed book, but the very name means unfolding. The very name means revealing. So the book of Revelation is an unfolding or revealing of God's love in the context of last day events at the end of time. Revelation 14, verse 6, we begin to study in this presentation, this message of the three angels, this gospel of God's grace. Then I saw, John says, I saw it. What did you see, John? Another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So John looked up in heaven, and in prophetic vision, he saw an angel messenger flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. 
Another word for everlasting is the eternal gospel. So John saw this eternal gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the very foundation stone of the three angels' messages. If we study the three angels' messages and miss the gospel, we've missed the very foundation of the three angels' messages. We've missed the very foundation stone that is the that enables us to stand solidly on everything that comes after that. The gospel is that very heart, it's the very pulse, it's the very foundation stone of the three angels' messages. Now we might ask, what is the gospel? The gospel has to do with the life, the death, the resurrection, the intercession. The gospel is a big word if we can translate it as good news. It's the good news of Jesus. You know, when the thief hung on the cross, he experienced the gospel. And you remember when Jesus was dying, there were three crosses on the hill that day. There was, Christ was in the center cross and two thieves died on either side of Jesus. One thief mocked Christ. One thief said, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross. But the other thief looked at Jesus dying on that cross. The other thief heard Christ's words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That thief was impressed by the Holy Spirit. He accepted the fact of his own guilt, that he had gone astray. He accepted the fact of his sinfulness. He accepted that in Christ there was forgiveness, that Christ's righteousness could atone for his sin. That thief, that day, asked for salvation. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. I say to you this day, this day that I'm dying on the cross, this day that it doesn't look like I can save anybody, this day with the nails through my hands, this day with the crown of thorns upon my head, this day with the blood running down my cheeks from the thorns in my brow, this day with the blood running down my wrists, this day I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, while he was dying on the cross, gave the thief the assurance that one day he would live with him forever and ever and ever in, in the kingdom of God. You see, what is grace? Grace has to do with the righteousness of God manifest in Christ. What is grace? It is the salvation that God freely offers in Christ. When Paul defines the gospel, he defines it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 3. You know, you can look for a lot of human definitions where people write books on defining what they believe the gospel is. But the Apostle Paul makes it very simple, and God often makes simple things that are complex. And the Apostle Paul says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received in which you stand. Now notice what the text says. Paul says, I declare to you the gospel. So he's going to explain it. He says he preached the gospel to them. They received the gospel. They stood in the gospel. Well, what was this gospel that he preached? What was this gospel that he received? For I delivered to you first that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So what is the gospel? It is Christ dying for our sins according to the scripture. He continues that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, and he was seen by Cephas or Peter, then by the twelve. So what is the gospel? It is the perfect life of Christ atoning for our imperfect lives. What is the gospel? It is the death of Christ bearing the guilt and shame of sin on Calvary's cross in the place of our death. We deserve to die. He gives us life. We deserve to wear a crown of thorns. He gives us a crown of glory. We deserve to hang on the cross. He hangs on the cross and we sit upon a throne. We deserve to wear the robe of sinfulness and degradation. He wears that robe for us and gives us a robe of righteousness. Christ enters the domain of death, dies the second death in our behalf. 
He who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, becomes sin for us. Cursed is everyone that hangs upon the tree, Galatians 3, verse 13. So Jesus takes all the shame. He takes all the guilt. He takes all the condemnation of sin upon himself. He dies the death we should have died so that we can live the life that he should have lived. What is the gospel? It is more than Christ's death, because if Jesus died and never resurrected, he's just a martyr dying for good cause. But Christ goes into the grave, he comes out, and he's alive. And that's what Paul says. Paul says that Jesus died, he, but Jesus rose again. I stood there looking at the mausoleum of Lenin at Lenin's tomb in Red Square. And I've stood there thinking they've pres- the Russian scientists have preserved Lenin and he's in this glass tomb and people would come and reverence him. They'd stand in long lines during the heyday of communism. But Lenin was in his tomb. But thank God Jesus Christ is not in his tomb. The tomb of Christ is empty. Jesus is alive. That's the gospel. And Jesus lives for you and me. We can come to him. He gives us his strength and power to live a godly life. Jesus delivers us from sin's penalty, from the condemnation of sin. He delivers us from sin's power. And one day, finally, Jesus will deliver us from sin's presence. What is the gospel? It is Christ delivering us from the penalty of sin. It's condemnation. Christ delivering us from the power of sin, the grip of sin. And Christ delivering us from the presence of sin. What is the gospel? It is the life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ and the promise that the Christ that lived, the Christ that died, the Christ that resurrected, the Christ that's in heaven for us, this Christ will come again and save us. The crucified Christ redeems us from the condemnation and guilt of our past. The resurrected Christ gives us power for the present. And the returning Christ gives us hope for the future. This is the big, huge picture of the gospel of Christ outlined in the book of Revelation. It is this Jesus who Paul speaks about. This Jesus that Paul leads us to give our entire lives to. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation. This is the cornerstone, the foundation of the entire message of the three angels. The Apostle Paul describes the gospel further this way, Romans 3, verse 24 to 26, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that is a ransom. Now notice we're justified freely, not justified because of what we have done, but justified because of what he has done. Not justified because of our goodness, but justified because of his righteousness. Not justified because of the fact that we live a perfect life. Our lives are imperfect and sinful, but he's the one that lived the perfect life. We're justified because we accept his perfect life in the place of our imperfection. We accept his death in the place of our death. We accept his righteousness in the place of our guilt and our shame. We're justified, what's the next word? You got it, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth. He is that propitiation. He is the one that paid the ransom price through faith in his blood to declare whose righteousness? Is it ours? to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. When I come to Jesus, I have absolutely nothing to give. When I come to Jesus, I come with my sinfulness. I come with my weakness. I come with my folly. But I come, I come. And you can come today. You say, but I'm too much of a sinner. That's why you come. You say, but I've fallen in the past. That's why you come. You say that I'm not righteous. That's why you come. Jesus says, come unto me. Come unto me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the very heart of God's last day message for humanity. I saw another angel, John says, flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, the gospel, the good news that you can come. Come to the cross 
and let the drops of blood symbolically fall upon you. Let that blood cover your sin and cleanse you from sin, knowing that as you reach out to Christ, he's already reaching out to you. That desire you have to know Jesus, that desire you have to be forgiven by Christ, that desire you have to be free from guilt, that desire you have to live the new life, that desire has been implanted in your heart by Jesus. He is drawing you to himself. Jesus said in John 12, verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to me. The cross is drawing you. The love of God is indeed drawing you. We are justified freely by grace. Grace is a declaration of God's righteousness. We are not righteous. He is. We receive that. Through grace, God justifies those who believe in Jesus. What does it mean to be justified? Simply saying, it means I stand before God clothed in the robe of righteousness, surrounded by God's grace, filled by God's love, just as if I had never sinned. God accepts me just as he accepts his own son. Now that thought is overwhelming. In fact, it's a mind boggling thought that when I am come to Christ, I am accepted, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, in the beloved. I'm accepted in heaven just as Jesus is accepted in heaven. You say, is it that simple? It is that simple. Reach out by faith to his righteousness. Reach out by faith to his goodness. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 says, For when we were still without strength, we were without what? Strength. In due time. What's that mean? In the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. You and I have been ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. What does God demonstrate toward us? His own what? Love. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here we find that God in love reaches out. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have pushed this universe into the far reaches of space and quarantined it and let sin destroy and kill us all. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have blotted them out like some mosquito and started all over again. But God's love was too great for that. While we were yet sinners, God's love reached out to us to save us. And God's love is reaching out to you today, my friend. God's grace is unmerited. God's grace is undeserved. God's grace is unearned but it is ours in Christ. That is the gospel. I love the way it's put in a book called Desire of Ages, one of the most outstanding books ever written in the history on the life of Christ. It's on page 753. It says, Upon Christ, as our substitute in surety, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor, that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. So when Jesus hung on Calvary's cross, he was counted a transgressor. The judgment bar of God was set up on Calvary's cross, and Christ, who had lived a perfect, righteous life, was counted, a, a judged as a sinner. That's why in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says he tasted death for every man. So he experienced the eternal death that you and I should have died on the cross that day. He could not see himself coming through the tomb. He only saw the darkness of tomb because of the guilt of sin. This statement goes on. The wrath of God, Desire of Ages, page 753, against sin. The terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation all his life. Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by us. Can you imagine that? Jesus lived with the Father. From the ceaseless ages of eternity, Christ is the eternal Christ. He never had a beginning and will never have an ending. Do you have a son or a daughter? Are you a parent? What if you had this sense that you would never see your son again? You'd never see your daughter again. 
What if you had this sense that your son or daughter was going to be eternally lost and you'd never see them again? What if you have a wonderful relationship with a father or mother and, and, and you, you sense that you are separate from them forever? However much you love a son or daughter, however much you love a father or mother, that cannot reflect one drop in the ocean of God's love for his son and the son for the father. Their love was unending, undying. Their love was infinite. And as Jesus hung on the cross, bearing the guilt and shame of sin, all he could see was that guilt and shame. Certainly, he said, you destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up again. But at the point of his death on the cross, all he saw was the darkness of sin. And he, all he saw was the tomb. And he sensed that because of sin, he would be separated from the Father forever. But he said, if this saves Mark Finley, I'm willing to do it. If this saves Tom or Harry or Mary or Jane, I'm willing to do it. Christ was willing to have his heart torn apart and to have the pain of sin separate him from the Father forever if it could save you or me. That is a love that is incomprehensible. Notice what it says. Hope did not present to his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared. What did Jesus fear? What was Jesus' greatest fear on the cross? Was it the nails? Was that the greatest pain? Was it the crown of thorns? Not at all. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ on the cross feared that the separation from the Father was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as the sinner's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So as Christ hung there, the guilt of sin, the shame of sin, the condemnation of sin was so great that he felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when he's lost at the end. What is the essence of hell? The essence of hell is the sense of abandonment by God, the sense of no longer having the presence of God. It is the pain and mental anguish and agony where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Certainly, there will be physical pain in hell. But that physical pain of the flames of hell, when the individual is consumed and gone from God's presence forever, that is not the deepest pain. The deepest pain is this sense of separation from God forever. Jesus felt that on the cross. And he was willing to experience that forever because he loves you so much. That's what this message of the first angel is all about. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. In a generation starved for love, the gospel presents love beyond what we could ever imagine. It presents a Christ that did for us what is unimaginable, offering his divine life on the cross. The story of the cross is the story of boundless. It's the story of unfathomable. It's the story of incomprehensible. It's the story of undying. It's the story of unending. It's the story of infinite love of Christ who longs to be with us forever. And as Jesus hung his head and died, the father said, son, the sacrifice is accepted. And all of heaven sang, all of heaven rejoiced. Jesus Christ died once so that when he comes again the second time, he could take you home. Were you worth Christ's sacrifice? Were you worth Christ's sacrifice? Were you worth what Christ gave for you, the infinite life of the Son of God? You say, Pastor Mark, I'm, I'm not worth it. If you are not worth the sacrifice Christ paid for you, Christ got cheated. He thinks you're worth it. You are more valuable than you can possibly imagine. And if Christ loses you, he can never replace you. The value of an object is dependent on the price paid for the object. You are valuable. And Christ gave all for you. And we give all to him. Sin no longer reigns in our life. We may fail. But sin no longer has dominion because the love of Christ breaks the bondage of sin. Romans 8 verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We are no longer in the bondage of sin. Sin's guilt is gone. Sin's condemnation is gone. The chains that hold us are gone. Why? Because love has broken those chains and love has broken that bondage. The plan of salvation was not an afterthought. It was not something that Christ said, hey, we got an emergency, we better deal with it. Not at all. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. For you know, not you think, not you guess, not maybe, not perhaps, you know, that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen. Now, don't miss this. This is what we need to get. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So before the world was created, the father and son, knowing that if they gave the human race the freedom of choice or the capacity of choice, that Adam and Eve could make the wrong choice. But, at, but God did not want robot creatures. He did not want mere puppets. God gave the freedom of choice, knowing full well the situation that of Adam and Eve, that he, God would come. He would give them every reason to make the right choice. But the plan of salvation was put into effect even before Adam and Eve fell. God loved the human race so much that he wanted to ensure the salvation of the human race. And that plan was put into action in heaven. The, it is the everlasting gospel. What does Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 say? I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the what? The everlasting gospel. Why is the gospel everlasting? It's everlasting, number one, because it was put into motion in heaven in the ceaseless ages of eternity. It's everlasting, number two, because it speaks to every generation. It speaks to every culture. It speaks to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It's everlasting, number three, because it'll never get old. The story of the cross, the story of Christ, the story of his love, the story of his grace, the story of his mercy will indeed never get old. It is love that breaks our hearts. It's love that changes our lives. Forced allegiance is contrary to God's very nature. The beast uses force. The beast in the last days of earth's history says that unless you follow me, no man can buy, no man can sell. Uh, you'll be imprisoned, you'll be beaten, you'll be ridiculed, you'll be mocked, and you'll be put to death. That's what the beast says. The beast tries to use forced allegiance, but Christ appeals to us with love. And when we see the love of God, it breaks our hearts. We were made to love. Our hearts are starved for love. And it is God's love revealed on Calvary that does change our lives. In Desire of Ages, page 22, it says, the plan for our redemption was not a what? We read it in 1 Peter, didn't we? An afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which for, has been kept in silence through times eternal. What is that mystery that has been kept in silence from times eternal? It is the mystery of God's love. It is the mystery of God's grace. And it is that mystery of his love and grace that is to be proclaimed to the end of the earth in a generation starved for love. In this era, in this generation, the earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. And what is God's glory? It is his love, is his character. And that love changes people's heart. Desire of Ages, page 22 again. It was the unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. And what are those principles? To love God supremely and to love one another in relationship to a generation starved for genuine love, longing for meaningful relationships. The gospel speaks of acceptance, forgiveness, belonging, and life-changing power. There was an old country western song that said, only if somebody knew who I was, only if somebody loved me. For a generation starved with love, young people looking for love, looking to fill that aching void within. Husbands, wives looking for love. Have you ever noticed that however much your parents love you, you still feel a love deficit? However much a husband or wife loves you, there's still that love deficit in your life. Have you ever noticed that you can never get enough of love? The reason for that is because God has made us to love him. 
God has placed a divine vacuum within our hearts, a divine hole, if you please, within our hearts that can only be filled up with his love into a generation starved for love, to a generation longing for meaningful relationships, to a generation that spends more time with technology than it does with open communication one with another, sharing our heart needs, sharing our burdens some time ago. My wife and I were at a meeting and we were walking to a speaking appointment that I had and I saw a group of five young people sitting on the wall. They were teenagers and they had their cell phones out and they were texting and I didn't think much of it until I stopped and said, hey, um, that's kind of interesting. You guys are all sitting here texting. Everybody's texting. Who are you texting? One another. They're sitting on a wall and they're, they're not communicating verbally, eye to eye, face to face. They're texting one another. Could it be any question why we're starved for human relationships? Has technology actually taken the place at times of relationships? Sharing, opening our hearts to one another. God can fill that relationship void in your heart. He can fill your heart with love so that you can reach out with lo in love and kindness to others around you. And one day when Jesus Christ comes and he returns, we are ushered into eternity to see him face to face and experience the joy of his love forever and ever and ever. The Christ that died on the cross is coming again to take us home. Now, some time ago, Ellen White was asked the question, is this message of the three angels the message of justification by faith that you've been talking about. Is it that message of justification by faith in the Bible? In the Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, she wrote, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the, me is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it's the third angel's message in verity. Let me summarize that very, very quickly for you. The gospel is the message that righteousness is in Christ, not in ourselves. That's the first angel's message. First angel's message leads us to open our hearts to Christ, to commit our lives to Christ, to accept Christ as the only one who can stand for us in the judgment. Second angel's message, which we'll study more deeply in another presentation, is Babylon is fallen is fallen. What's Babylon all about? It's self-centered, self-inflated importance that substitutes human opinion and human ideas for the grace of Christ. It substitutes human traditions and teachings for the word of Christ. It is human-centered. Human what about the message on the mark of the beast? What is that? The essence of the mark of the beast is egotistical man's thinking he has the authority to change the very law of God. So what is righteousness by faith? Righteousness by faith is trusting Jesus for my salvation. Righteousness by faith is trusting Jesus' power so that I can live a godly life. Righteousness by faith is accepting Christ's word as he has spoken it. Righteousness by faith is putting my confidence in Jesus and his word and living in harmony with that. Jesus saves us not because we are good, because, but because he is good. All of our good works are motivated by his love and empowered by his grace. We come to Christ just as we are, but we do not remain as we are. We are changed by his grace. Righteousness by faith is God's unending love. It's his abounding grace. They are at the very heart of these three angels' messages that we're studying, that we're going to unfold more and more and more each presentation in this series. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us that if we're motivated by Christ's love, changed by Christ's love, that the love of Christ compels us, what is it that causes men and women to go to the ends of the earth, leave family and friends, and leave for missions? It is because they've been charmed by his love, changed by his grace, redeemed by his power. The three angels' message according to Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 is to go to all the world. The message of the three angels leads us from the preoccupation with our own self-interest to a passion for Christ's service. You cannot come to the cross and remain silent. The cross changes you. The cross makes you over again. Matthew 19 verse 20 says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Jesus 
last words were go, go to the ends of the earth and make disciples to all nations. Revelation 14, 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven with the everlasting gospel to preach to who? To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This message will not die out in some whimper. This message will not go out like some candle in the wind blown out into insignificance. This message of the three angels will rise to its destiny. It will leap across geographical boundaries. It will go penetrate language groups. The message of Jesus Christ, people, men and women, boys and girls, committed to Christ, changed by Christ, will go to the ends of the earth proclaiming his message in the last days of earth's history. There's an interesting book called The Quest for More, Living for Something Bigger Than You by Paul David Tripp that, that has a statement that really stunned me when I read it. Human beings were created to be part of something bigger than their own lives. Sin causes us to shrink our lives down to the size of our lives. The grace of Christ is given to rescue us from the claustrophobic confines of our own little self-focused kingdom and frees us to live for the eternal purposes and satisfying delights of the kingdom of God. We live in a culture that has institutionalized self-focus and personal entitlement. If you look around, it's very clear that we need to be rescued from ourselves. Things like debt, addiction, Obesity, divorce are the fruits of a culture of self-focus where we look for meaning where meaning cannot be found. There is freedom to be found in living for something bigger than yourself. Ultimately, it means living for the glory of God and the success of his agenda for the world he made. If you want to be part of something big for God, you want to be part of something great for God. You're a young person looking for meaning in your life. You have been maybe playing church you are an adult and you've been simply coming and sitting in the pew. There's something bigger and grander than the self-occupation and self-focus. That is a life committed to sharing his love. A life committed to taking the word of God to your friends and neighbors. This message of the three angels, this message of God's grace is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. God is inviting you to something big and grand and large to be part of something that is spanning the earth and lightening it with his very glory. God is inviting you not simply to take a stand for Christ and sit in the pew. God is inviting you to something big, something grand, something great for his eternal kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, verse 14, shall be preached, not it might be preached, in all the world as a witness to all nations, then shall the end come. You can be part of something big for God. You can be part of something grand for God. You can be part of something that is much larger. It will go to the world as a witness to all nations. Not going to die out in a whimper, not at all. Abraham LaRue was a shepherd, a woodcutter from California. He became a Christian and a committed Adventist Christian when he was in his 60s. He was 65 years old and the Lord laid a burden on his heart. Take the gospel message to China. Abraham LaRue wrote a letter and he wrote it to the Seventh-day Adventist headquarters. And he said, God has laid a burden on my heart to take the gospel to China. Now, mind you, he didn't know Chinese. Mind you, he didn't have any money. He was 65 at the time. General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists wrote back and they said to him, well, well, Brother LaRue, you're a little old for this assignment. You know, there are no believers that we have in China and we don't have the money to send you. But you know what? Hawaii, that's, that's out in the Pacific someplace. Uh, if you could happen to get there, and maybe you could sell Christian literature. So LaRue got a lot of books together, Christian books, and he raised his money, went out to Hawaii. But then, after he sold a few books there, the next book, the next boat he could find, LaRue, on his own money, went to China. And there began selling books. And there, this man, now in his late 60s, labored year after year after year. And after years of labor, there were six people baptized. But today, because of the roots, that that, the seeds that that man sowed, and the roots that sprouted up in the fruits, Today, there are hundreds of thousands of Adventist Christians all over China. 
Who would have thought that God could use a 65-year-old layperson to open the doors for the gospel to go to China? He got a sense of the bigness, the grandness, the greatness of this message called the three angels. And here he caught the significance of Revelation 14, verse 6. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel of God's grace to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. God is calling you into your neighborhood. God is calling you into your community. God may lay a burden on you for mission service. The everlasting gospel is to go to the ends of the earth. Great Controversy, page 612 says, Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. The earth is going to be lightened with the glory of God. The message of the three angels is going to go to the ends of the earth. The message of the gospel of Christ is going to be carried. You can be part of something big for God. It is almost time for the Lord to come. Do you sense the moving of God's spirit? Do you sense in the conditions of our world that it's time to move out for Christ? It's time to make a decision for Christ. It's time to share the Word of God with others. It's time to give Bible studies, time to pass out literature, time to invite people to watch godly television programs. It's time to get involved for Christ and be part of something big and grand for God. It is almost time for the Lord to come. Do you believe it? Listen as Charles sings and catch the spirit of this Advent movement of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people proclaiming God's grace. Charles. Tis almost time for the law to come. I hear the people sing. The stars of heaven are growing dim. It must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The signs foretold in the sun and moon and earth and sea and sky aloud proclaim to all mankind the coming of the master draweth nigh oh it must be the breaking of the day oh it must be the breaking of the day the night is almost gone the day is coming on oh it must be the breaking of the day oh it must be time for the waiting church to cast her pride away with girded lawns and burning lamps to look for the breaking of the day oh it must be the breaking of the day oh it must be the breaking of the day the night is almost gone the day is coming on oh it must be the breaking of the day so go quickly out in the streets and the lanes and in the broad highway and call the maimed, the haunt, and the blind to be ready for the breaking of that day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day. The night is almost gone. The day is coming on. Oh, it must be be the breaking of the day. Oh, it must be the breaking of the day.
God is leading you to know him more deeply, to trust him more fully, to be committed to him in a way that you've never been committed before. We're living on the knife edge of eternity. We're living in a crisis hour of this earth's history. We're living with uncertainty all around us. We sense it in our hearts. We feel it deep within. And God is leading each one of us to step out from comfortable convenience. As the song says, go out into the lanes, the highways. Go knock on your neighbor's door. Develop a loving relationship with them and share Christ. Share Christ with the people in your workplace. Share Christ there in your community. Share Christ as he opens doors of opportunity for you. Would you like to make a commitment right now as I pray that for you it's no more business as usual, no more pleasures as usual, no more life as usual, that you have a great desire as God opens doors of opportunity to share his love with others, to share this great message of Bible truth, the message of the three angels. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts that we can live for something bigger than ourselves, something greater than self-focus, something greater than the preoccupation with our own needs and desires. The gospel breaks our hearts. The love of Christ sends us out into the world, and that love leads us to be committed to share your love with others. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend of mine, Jesus himself is calling you. Stay with us through this entire series. Next presentation, we're going to talk about Revelation 14, verse 7, and the judgment bar of God. What is the judgment? And how can you have confidence to pass the judgment? And God bless you this week.